Next, we have two presenters, Neil Richards and Jonathan Heisel. Professor Richards is the Koch Distinguished Professor of Law, and Dr. Heisel is Professor of Pathology and Immunology in the School of Medicine. Together, they are co-directors of the Cordell Institute for Policy in Medicine and Law, a joint venture between our law school and med school. Today, they will talk about the future of human data in healthcare and beyond. Please join me in welcoming them. Thank you, and good morning. As Lee mentioned, I'm John Heisel, a professor of pathology and genetics at the medical school, and a physician scientist that trained at this great institution 25 years ago. I returned in 2014 to help lead a revolution in precision medicine here, a transformation of healthcare that today is largely driven by advanced big data DNA sequencing technologies, technologies that I get to help coordinate. I'm honored to represent the medical school as one of the directors for the Cordell Institute. And I'm Neil Richards, as Lee mentioned, the Koch Distinguished Professor of Law, and I have written and taught about information privacy law and uh, freedom of speech at the law school for the last 16 years. Now, it might surprise you to learn that unlike most doctors and lawyers, John and I actually do enjoy spending time together. <laughs> From very different perspectives, we enjoy exploring the complex problems at the intersection of science and technology and policy and ethics. Today, Neil and I want to tell you about the Cordell Institute for Policy in Medicine and Law. The Cordell Institute arose from the daring vision of its founders, Dr. Timothy Eberlein, director of Siteman Cancer Center, and Professor Nancy Stout, dean of our law school. Their vision was to combine the outstanding strengths of the medical school and the law school around precision medicine, a vision that was formally dedicated into reality last September, following a generous gift from law school alumni Joseph and Yvonne Cordell. Today, technologies powered by human information are creating unprecedented opportunities and also posing unprecedented challenges throughout most aspects of our lives. From precision medicine, to live traffic routing, to electoral manipulation, and human gene editing, where a scientist in China has already claimed success in altering human embryos to be resistant to HIV infection embryos that were brought forward to live births of baby girls last fall. This is a profound event, one that has gained widespread attention and raised concern across the globe. Interestingly, these developments all arose in part through contributions from our institution, Washington University. 60 years ago, in 1962, proud Washington University alum and the director of DARPA, JCR Licklider, envisioned a set of network computers that ultimately became what today we call the internet. And 20 years ago, Washington University was one of four advanced DNA sequencing centers that spent a decade mapping out the first draft of the human genome. From there, physician scientists used the awesome sequencing power of what has become the McDonald Genome Institute to decipher the first genetic maps for cancer, identifying mutations driving myeloid leukemia and then lung cancer, just to name the first two. Today, the advanced methods can peer inside and see the genetic operating program of a single cell. There's no doubt these technologies have the potential to dramatically improve the lives of people right here in St. Louis and hopefully throughout the world. Beyond sequencing or even healthcare, these technologies have the undeniable power to do good for large swaths of the human population, but they also pose undeniable dangers, particularly if we fail to recognize their harms or if we deploy them in ways that are unethical. Indeed, consider human gene editing that I mentioned earlier. The CRISPR-Cas9 and related methods give us the potential to make very targeted, specific changes in the human genetic program, correcting mutations that cause disease and terrible suffering. But John, couldn't that go wrong? Couldn't that be used to create enhanced humans? Science fiction, <laughs> in two Star Trek movies, has explored the perils of creating superhumans like Khan, Noonie, and Singh. These literary sources remind us that there are great dangers in trying to tinker with humans to create improved or perfect humans, even if we could imagine what that might look like. Yes, Neil's right. And there's an important point here that goes beyond genetic information. Potentially, all human information could be used in undesirable or potentially unpleasant ways, which is why Europe has recently come forward with its comprehensive 
General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR. And why California has recently passed a state-level comprehensive privacy law, and why Congress, if it ever gets to do anything, uh, is in, in the midst of considering a US national-level version of the GDPR, something that I've recently written an article about with one of our Cordell Institute fellows. But Neil, if we overregulate these technologies, don't we run the risk of denying ourselves some potential benefits, like targeted therapies of cancer, or intelligent data-driven solutions to really difficult public health problems like malnutrition of the sort that Dr. Gordon spoke about earlier? That's a real problem too, and it's made worse because regulators might not understand the underlying science, and more generally, we lack a widely shared ethics of human information. We have this ethics for older technologies that allows us to harness their benefits and mitigate their harms, but these technologies are just too new and moving too fast for us to properly wrap our minds around them. And yet the world moves forward. Today, right here in St. Louis, there are projects underway that seek to understand whether human genetic diversity can be used to improve the health care of people right here in St. Louis, regardless of where they live or what they can afford. But how would we handle the data? to be sure that privacy is protected where it matters most? How do we pr protect our friends and neighbors from unintended harms or unexpected harms? How do we earn their trust as subjects in big data studies in ways that uh, protect them and that we can be sure to handle uh, research across cultural and genetic differences. The lawyer in me wonders what legal agreements would cover this data and how it would govern whether it is shared beyond our university and under what terms. What laws or legal frameworks would protect our employees from harm and our university from legal liability? These are precisely the questions that the Cordell Institute seeks to answer. Modern technology is advancing very rapidly. Existing laws and ethics simply can't keep up. We want to see if we can help the ethical and legal frameworks adapt more quickly to become dynamic. Modern technology and modern medicine have the potential for saving and improving lives. There's no doubt about that. We think we can help the scientists and the corporate executives, lawmakers, judges, regulators, and the public at large navigate some of the complexities, mitigate some of the misinformation that could hinder this digital future that we see, a future that runs on human data. To do this, we draw upon the vast transdisciplinary expertise in science and medicine, policy and ethics that only a world-class research institution like Washington University can boast, as well as upon a national network of fellows. The mission of the Cordell Institute is simple to state, but a challenge to achieve, to pioneer an ethical, data-driven future to promote health and protect people. So Neil, let's conclude this conversation with a few examples of how the Cordell Institute is already getting involved with these issues. A few snapshots of what we've been doing and where we plan to be working over the next several years. First, as Neil mentioned, we've built a national network of fellows, enlightened corporate executives from large information technology companies, leaders of security, privacy, and health practice groups at major law firms across the nation, prominent scholars and faculty from peer institutions including a recent MacArthur Genius Award winner, and of course our own Washington University faculty and graduate students, scientists, lawyers, technologists, and other experts interested in health, ethics, genomics, and information law on both sides of Forest Park. Our university's blood-brain barrier. We've, we've also hosted events here in St. Louis. It, it wasn't my joke, it was Dr. Shen's. Um, but it was very funny. We've also hosted events here in St. Louis, across the country, and around the world, bringing together internationally renowned experts to work together on these problems under the Washington University Cordell Institute banner. On the policy front, our Cordell Institute fellows have testified in Washington, D.C. three times in the past year. First, in February, Professor Rachel Sachs testified before the House Ways and Means Committee about the high cost of prescription drugs. Then Professor Woody Hartzog testified before the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation about policy principles in forming a federal data privacy framework here in the United States. And then you, Neil, in March, testified before the FTC that patients and consumer <laughs> consent alone are insufficient when dealing with some of the human information problems these technologies bring about. Wow, that's a nice tie.
It was a gift of A&D. Um, <laughs> It is a nice tie, though. As <coughs> academics, we've, uh, we've recently published a major volume of scholarship in the pages of the Washington University Law Review on privacy and trust in the digital age. This is the product of our launch conference from, from last, this time last year. And actually, next week, we're going to be hosting on Friday our annual conference, Cordell 3, delving into the problems surrounding the ethics of human genome editing. And please come join us. In addition, our academic work is already starting to influence uh, pending bills in this space, such as Senator Schatz's recently introduced Data Care Act. We also put our voices together with others that share our concerns and our commitment, such that the Cordell Institute is known not only to our leaders in Washington, D.C., but across the globe, where French President Emmanuel Macron speaks our name alongside other early signatories to his Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace. Now, these are just a few highlights, but our work as a whole is intended to advance the discussions around the policy and ethics of human information-based technologies, particularly in the health sector, but also beyond. These are difficult, complex, nuanced problems, but they're precisely the kind of problems that leading international research universities, like our own Washington University, are best placed, and indeed, arguably even obligated, to work to solve. Thank you. <laughs>